Welcome to the Wimbo Worldwide F1 Podcast. F1 content around the globe. Hello everyone and welcome to the Wimbo F1 Podcast. We're going worldwide again and this time we're going to India. On the other side of me is Sharan and Sharan is from India and he's a writer for Sportskita. I met him on Twitter. We talk to each other all the time and I invited him to do this podcast with us. So Sharan, how's it going? Oh, it's fun. I'm the second or third uh, uh, third guest on your podcast. Um, you're the second. You're the second guest. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So let's make it the best one, at least until well, now. <laughs> well, we're still learning, but um, yeah. Hey, let's, let's make it the best bar. one. Every, every podcast we make should be the best one. I agree. It should be fun. So, uh, India. Um, F1 in India. Is it popular? Uh, to be honest, no, it isn't. The most popular thing in India is cricket. Uh, yeah. I'm, are you familiar with it? Um, I mean, uh, Dutch have their own team, but they are not. it's not the primary sport in Netherlands, I guess, if I'm right. No, cricket is not a big thing here. Yeah. So in India, the most followed sport is cricket. When it comes to Formula 1, it's probably... It's not even close. No one follows. To be very honest, no one follows. Very, very rarely you'll find people who are actually fans of the sport. And uh, yeah, it has increased. To be honest, uh, Drive to Survive has helped a lot. A lot of people have basically jumped on the bandwagon now. But the number is still quite small. It's growing. Um, as far as I know, I know from, from a few of my you know fellow Formula One fans, it has been growing in India, but nothing, not even close to the levels of probably America or even Euro Europe is an entirely different league in that sense. So, so you never get to watch races with friends? Oh, no, <laughs> I never no. have. So you just, These days um... yeah, I do it on my own. I mean, I've been doing it on my own since 2005. So it's what, 17, 18 years now. You're but an OG the... fan. Uh, trust me, I know people who have been following since 1980s. So I'm nobody in front of them. And there are people who have been following the sport since since Prost was racing, since Nicky Lauda was racing. So I've known those people as well. But yeah, in terms of the newbie fans, I guess I am. I am getting old, I guess. <laughs> well, it's good. It's good to have people uh, on the podcast with um, <clears throat> a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. Um. I'm trying to think of Indian drivers in uh, F1, and the only one I can think of is uh, Karun Chanduk. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, mostly. Yeah, Karun Chanduk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good pronunciation at least. Um, I, I think he's two. one of the best pundits out there as well. In terms of analysis, I agree with you. Uh, the amount of homework he does, and it's not only when he is at Sky. Uh, I think. Maybe uh, if others are also watching, uh, try to keep an eye on whenever Chandok appears at uh, Bring Back v -tens. It's a podcast for the race and the amount of analysis and knowledge that he has. It's unparalleled. Quite good. Bring Back v -tens. It's for uh, the race. Uh, the race, they, ha they have their two F1 podcasts. The first is the one where they follow the day-to-day -day things and then there is for the V10 era. And it's quite well, well, fun. I wrote it down and I'll put a link down in the description. So yeah. I'm always looking for uh, new stuff to watch. Oh, yeah. you. Uh, if you like history, you'll love it. It's great. Anything else about Sharon Chanduk? I, uh, I, I, watched, Karen, yeah. I watched this uh, podcast from um, Beyond the Grid. Mm -hmm. And um, it was... It, his career was wasted because he was in uh, cars that were 10 seconds slower than uh, the rest of the grid. Oh, yeah. HRT. Uh, so the thing is, when it comes uh, in, in from India, there have been two drivers. Karun, Karun Chandok, uh, I guess you know him. You might also be aware of Narain Kartigayan. He was called the Cucumber by uh, Sebastian Vettel in 2012. 
in terms of driving abilities i'd say narin kartikeyan is probably the best that we've had karun was second um right now even this season uh, in f2 we have two indian drivers now we have jehan daruwala um and the second one is kushmani now how the first one is with red bull isn't he he was with red bull until last season now he's okay. not yeah so fortunately he he had a good backing um now i think he'll be doing it on, doing it independently this season he's with i'm not sure he's with mp motorsports the team that won the title last year last year with dragovic let's see how it does <laughs> I'm I don't know how well he'll do. I've seen him catch a lot of hate online because it's his fourth season in F2 but at least he's representing. So yeah. something to look forward to. Okay. Hey, and um another uh, character from India in F1 was uh, VJ. VJ Malia. <laughs> my wife my wife and I are watching um Drive to Survive every season because my wife hadn't seen it. Mm-hmm. And um yeah season 1 he's in it because uh Force India is uh yeah going bankrupt and Lawrence Stroll steps in and um buys it and turns it into racing point. Yeah. Not not a good day for not a good day for us Indians to be very honest. At least we had some presence with Vijay there. Uh but to be honest let's be fair. Um he didn't have the money. The team was cash strapped. It did an amazing job to be very honest i think vijay took over in 2008 2008 or 2009 until 2017 or 2018 the record that force india had you compare it with what aston martin or uh, racing point has done force india was much better yeah they, they made a small and budget woman, work but it was really the Oh yeah, they made it work. How they did that, I am not sure. I still don't understand how that team was easily the fourth fastest or fifth fastest team most of the times. Now we have Aston Martin. They finished what sev- seventh last season, and yeah. they and they have an abundant budget. So, I mean, to be honest, uh, when it comes to Vijay, well, he was a racer. Uh, he raced for MRI for something in 1980s. He wanted to own a team even then. but again uh, pretty much the son of a rich indian businessman he was also quite successful at the time when he got the team <laughs> but yeah i am not sure if you're aware he's currently in london or monaco or something where he's he can't come back to india because of some legal issues so it all went downhill for him <laughs> ever since he bought the team well I suppose london or um monaco are not the worst places to be stuck But, uh, oh yeah, but yeah, you can't come back to your own country. It's still terrible if you can't go into your own country. He had ridiculous resources to be honest when he was in India. He was one of the top 10 rich Indians, I guess at one point. He was a billionaire, he's not anymore. But yeah, uh he had his heyday. He, he's not having the best of times right now at least. No, I understand. So, next subject. Um your job as a writer for Sportskeeda. Now first explain oh, yeah. what Sportskeeda is for the people that don't know. Okay, so for people that don't know, uh Sportskeeda is it's nothing but an Indian website and it does not cover only a single sport. What Sportskeeda basically means is a nutter, a sports nutter, someone who is a fanatic of a sport. So when it comes to the website, it covers almost every sport. it has different verticals i work i work with the formula 1 vertical i started in 2019 as a part time uh, ultimately i was doing it as a uh, something on the as a side hustle uh, i had my primary job i worked at a bank and then this was something that i did as a side hustle because i i love formula formula 1 at that point slowly the hobby turned into a profession and here i am uh, last two seasons 2021 and 22 i have been well we covered it from end to end from the start to the finish so let's see what the third season holds for us let's see how it goes it's growing to be honest it's not at a level where we aspire it to be we have not gained the kind of trust that we should have amongst the viewers as well but let's see it will take time that's all well, i can you know we can try i i read your articles when i see them on uh, facebook 
And yeah. then uh, I immediately go to the comments. <laughs> Do you read them? Maybe. Uh, not often. Whenever I have, you can say, some steam to burn off. I do go there and if there is someone that is out of line, I roast them. I roast them like anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hold back. <laughs> no. If there is someone who comes out and is acting like this is bullshit. I Look, for me, one very simple thing is I try to be as factual and as logical as I can be. So whenever there is someone who is trying to point out this is wrong, this is this, I just my main habit is I try to bring down the facts and I list it in front of him. If he agrees, it's fine. If he, if he goes abusive, I don't waste my time. No. That's where I know it's not worth it. <laughs> no, but then there's this thing. If, if you write an article in favor of Max or hailing Max, then you're biased. And if you do one for Lewis Hamilton, then somebody says, <laughs> oh, sports kid only writes about Lewis Hamilton. Oh, man. Uh, but I suppose, had... I suppose that doesn't bother you. Uh, it did earlier um, when I started because, look, no one wants to be critiqued in that way. But then yeah. after some time, you understand that it's it's part of the job. Look, when you see people like, I mean, name any journalist or any person who writes about the sport and does not get abused. You won't find anyone. There's yeah. no one who is beyond reproach. So what's the point of me getting... I'm a nobody in that front. Uh, it's I've been here for two years. That's the kind of work experience I have. So I'm not really going to, you know, be pissed about it. I'm just happy I'm gaining attention. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the views. Thanks exactly. For the every, every comment pushes out uh, the, the algorithm more. So, oh, yeah. you know, let, let, them, let them go ahead. Look, um, the thing is, when ultimately it comes down to the fact that if I have been called a Max Verstappen fan, and then a Max Verstappen hater, then a Lewis Hamilton fan, and then even a racist. <laughs> Someone recently reached out to me. <laughs> Bro, what are you doing? <laughs> you are a racist because you talk because uh, he said you are a racist because you did a feature where you wrote Lewis Hamilton will not win the title. I said, yeah, I don't think he will. I said, you're a racist because you think that way. So I just I just blocked the guy and moved on. I mean, well, what can you do? Uh, I think Yuki Tsunoda won't win the title either. <laughs> so. Does that make me a racist as well then? Rob, uh, who knows? Look, the thing is, after a point, you know that the word calling, uh, personally, at least at least for me, one of the biggest pet peeves these days is the word terrorist, how commonly it is used. Oh, yeah. I don't understand. I, It's such a loaded word. How can it be used to describe a driver? Russell has, it has been used against Russell a lot. It has been used against Max quite a bit. And it's just foolish. Well, to be honest, I'm guilty of that as well. So <laughs> thank you for, thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> Probably. I just, that see, when, when somebody is driving wild and he causes, uh, you know, a string of incidents, then, mm. you know, th they call it terrorism. But um, That's foolish. Yeah. I mean... The thing is, the words that you use, because look, um, the word terrorist is used. OK, if we go by, you know, dictionary causing terror. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad thing if you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually factual if, if you get into one incident after the other. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. If, you know, Lewis Hamilton, before the season started last year, he said, uh, I'm going to cause some havoc. And then, oh. and then that meme was uh, was going around after every incident he had, and he had quite a few. Oh God! Yeah, he had the most incidents last year, but he's never called for that. I mean, it's okay. Uh, he's 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 a clean driver. To be very to be very honest, he he doesn't. At least, I've I've seen him drive into cars in 2011. If you ever want to see one of the worst races by a top line driver, watch Monaco 2011. I mean, right, Lewis, you should watch it because that race, I don't know what came over Lewis. He should have been red flagged. He should have been asked, just just come out. Buddy. You, you, I mean, I think in that race, he made Pastor Maldonado look good. That was, the, <laughs> I mean, he caused a red Talking flag. Talking about memes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he caused a red flag by crashing into Pastor Maldonado in Monaco. And that was one of the worst races of his career. And I've seen him do that 
at that point in time he has matured so much and he's to be honest yeah i mean we all have fun we all take the mickey out of him but i guess <laughs> of five drivers of all time lewis will be in that category to be to be bluntly honest because of the kind of success but- he had I I think um, Fernando Alonso had a point this year about uh, Lewis Hamilton uh, that he he's only used to starting at the front and then staying in front. You know, yeah. Because I th- there were many races where he just um, pulled a gap big enough to do a pit stop. Oh yeah. And then stay ahead, and then always ten laps before the end, he's like, "What's that sound?" And, <laughs> uh, my bono my tires are dead oh god <laughs> you know a bit of dra- a bit of drama before he had an easy win i mean um, after rosberg retired um the championships were they were pretty one sided to be very honest vettel did a great job in 17 in my view at least until the crash in singapore he was the better driver in 17 between the yeah. two 18 was a disaster ferrari what the I mean that team. That is why when when you wrote that this is Ferrari's year, I will not trust that statement until Charles Leclerc wins the title. <laughs> trust me, I will not trust it because I've I've seen that team for eighteen years. Yesterday I tweeted the same thing. I've seen that team for eighteen years, and every year at the car launch they will say that we are challenging for the title. We are in the best possible position, and then they implode. They've imploded so many times that I can trust. their failure right now that is how much i mean burnt burnt up that's the situation that every do, do you had. really feel that they that they um blew up last year or what did you call it um imploded did imploded. do you really feel that imploded last year because i'm i'm a pragmatic man yeah mm-hmm. um i see a season 2019 where they got caught with this sort of fuel hose thing mm-hmm. They had to change no, no, no. the whole uh, thing. Twenty nineteen was not a fuel hose thing. Twenty uh, nineteen, the car was just bad. Uh, they. I, I think it. I think it was five or six races in um in in that season when when they they couldn't use it anymore, and then the rest of that season uh, the they were really story. really bad. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, the twenty nineteen season. No. So what happened in that season was actually the season caught everyone out, other than Mercedes. Everyone else was caught out because the tires changed. It was uh, there was a change in treading of the Pirellis, and only Mercedes was able to extract the maximum, while Ferrari and Red Bull both both struggled. Ferrari, one of the biggest issues was the car was a rocket on the straight line, but when it came to corners, the car had no downforce. And uh, I think Leclerc lost the race in Bahrain because of it. And The thing is, uh, the decline started in 2018 when Binotto took over from Riva Benin. From that point onwards, the thing is, uh, okay, if I if I but, ask, but there story. was there wasn't a decline because in 2019 they ended up sixth, second, sixth. What? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you're talking about 2020. 2020. Yeah, they ended up sixth yeah. because uh, they, well, they had to change the, the car because of that fuel rate. thing. Yeah. Uh, the power issues, yeah. And then in 2021, they ended up third, mm-hmm. and in 2022, they ended up second. So there, there is progress if you if you look at it like uh, pragmatically. Yes, yes. Uh, the way you are, you know, the thing is, the issue that comes up with Ferrari is, okay, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something very similar. If someone has the potential to be the best car on the grid, and they consistently finish second, third, fifth, sixth. then will you say that they've imploded or they've done a poor job or will you say that yeah they're improving well I, i'm just marking a, a time where a significant change came i understand and I then understand. after that the the, the growth has uh, has set in and mm-hmm. if you look at what went wrong with ferrari last year you know mm-hmm. strategic mistakes um driver mistakes these things are, are pretty simple to solve and the they're package not, was good they're not they're not simple to solve the reason being you can draw a direct comparison between 2018 and 2022 they had the same issues in 2018 they had the same issues in 2022 in 2018 the in season development was poor in 2022 the in season development is 
yeah again uh, the same thing happened no by mid season red bull was clearly ahead and by the end of the season ferrari was not challenging them at all that was what yeah. happened in 2022 right then strategic issues the same I, thing I, yeah i i have one thing to say ferrari was hit hard by the technical directive uh, at the mid uh, they midway were, of uh, the season they were they were uh to an extent yes there is a theory behind that and the other issue is the fact that they had to turn the, turn down their engines apparently they were running at 80% of the capacity so when that happens um uh, according to uh, it was a report by an italian uh, i think formula 1 something name uh, formula uh, some italian website uh, they had sh- uh, they shared that the biggest issue with ferrari when it came to tire wear was that they were running the car at 80 uh, the power unit at 80% of the potential because of that the balance went haywire and they weren't able to keep the tires alive they were consuming it far too much and that's why the car the car just lost pace in the second half i think yeah. they didn't have it but yeah i think technical directive is something that happened but i won't put it entirely on that no at least yeah So I mean, uh, anyways, coming back to the fact why 2018 and 22, 22 were similar. The thing is, Ferrari's a team, at least uh, when it comes to the you can say the meat and potatoes, the basics. The basics suck. <laughs> in in blunt terms, why? Because most of the time that team is politically drowned entirely. In 2018, what happened? There was a um, there was an entire battle in the background between Arriva Bene and Binotto for the team principal role. Ultimately, Binotto won and he took over. That's why the 2018 season went completely off the rails. Then, uh, when it comes to the strategic unit, there was no clarity. Remember what happened in Silverstone last season uh, between Leclerc and Sainz? Leclerc was screwed royally, to be very honest. Why was he blocked? Uh, it didn't make any sense. the similar thing happened with vettel and raikkonen as well in various phases so the thing is uh, when the team has a clear direction in terms of building a good car i don't doubt ferrari they will always build a good car because in terms of infrastructure and passion they have it i mean uh, if you've seen the launch the ferrari launch you saw yeah i saw it it was I the mean, best one out there yeah and the I mean, it's obvious when you compare it with any other team. I mean, we also saw the Mercedes one, Red Bull, Mercedes, uh, McLaren, or any other team. No one had that kind of passion. So Ferrari will have that. They will build good cars. They will always do that. Will they win the title? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> Ultimately, that is where I stop short because there will always be some strategic issue. There will always be some politics in the background. When you well, have that. see, you're talking about the politics. Uh, there's this guy uh, behind the scenes. Uh, is his name John Alcan? Yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, Dietrich Mateschitz gave Helmut Marko okay. the free reign to to sort out that F1 team, and then mm-hmm. he got Christian Horner in. And you know, there's no politics there because those two, Horner and Marko, they just decide everything. and they've been doing um, it for 17 18 years now 2005 <clears throat> yeah oh yeah they debuted in 2005 but uh, at ferrari the, the, there's always uh, the head office uh, that, that that keeps meddling in yeah one of the biggest issues is that ferrari has struggled from it from time to time i think how many five or six team principals since horner took oh, over yeah. at uh, red bull that's you can't win titles that way I mean, imagine if for uh, if Horner was fired by Red Bull after uh, in 2014, when the car was a disaster, will Red Bull be winning titles? No, they won't. And that is something that Ferrari needs to learn from. Now, Fred Vasseur is a good. I feel he's a good team principal. He's very practical, very blunt. Yeah. And someone who might be able to, you know, knock some sense into how things need to be done at Ferrari. I hope so because look. I would love to see a Ferrari win because emotionally the kind of attachment they have, I don't see it in any other team. I mean, I think it would be good for the sport to see a sea of red, um, you know, uh, at the last race with the trophy. I agree, and I I could totally live with that as a Red Bull fan. 
Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, to be honest, I don't mind. I I prefer competition over single single team domination or a single driver domination. I've seen far too much of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hated Vettel in 2011, 2012 because <laughs> he came up at every weekend, and you knew you knew he was going to win. <laughs> it was so so predictable, and it's not like. And the biggest issue, you know, the one difference between Vettel's domination and Hamilton's domination was, Vettel was unapologetic. I have the fast car. I don't make mistakes. I win. He was very blunt about it. Yeah. While Lewis, while with Lewis, you see what you see. <laughs> I don't even need to elaborate on that. No. And and that rubbed the wrong way. To be honest, that rubbed rubbed the wrong way with every fan. With what he so did. So how Mexico. how do we get to a rant about Ferrari? We were talking about no your idea. job at Sportski there. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's good no, content. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> no clue how we how did we reach that? Oh yeah, I, I know. I wanted to say that sometimes I read your articles and then I turn them into YouTube videos for my channel. Oh, you do that? Can you give yes. me some credit? <laughs> Just add my name somewhere in the casual F1 fan. Just no, do that. <laughs> I, I put the source in. I put the source oh, in the in the description. That's nice. So That's nice. I, I can give you half of the profits because I'd I'm not monetized anything. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so half of nothing is still nothing. Oh, I, I I love the credit. Maybe someday it will materialize. <laughs> yeah, I'll take. So, the but I'll definitely I'll de- definitely keep an eye out for your next uh, article. And um, yeah, if I can turn it into a nice three four minute video, you know, That's one nice. for during the week, then um, yeah, then I'll do yeah, it. <laughs> So, topic number four is the expe- <clears throat> the expectations of the season. You okay. know, we okay. just had the 2022 season, new regulations. Everybody's going to uh, got to grips with the new car and and how everything works. What do you think 2023 will bring in that regard? Okay. Uh, so how long have you been following Formula One? If I may ask, um, you. I watched my first race in 2015 at the debut of uh, Max Verstappen. Oh, nice! That was uh, my first race. Okay, so uh, you have some uh, some idea about what happened in 2010. Um, 2010 was the year after Braun uh, won. Yes, and yes. you know, I I read um, what do you call them? Um, Jensen Button's biography. Oh, you read it? Yeah. Nice. It's a great book. So what happened in 2010 was, yeah, I think some some uh, like double diffuser or something got banned. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that got banned. Uh, so what happened in 2010 was we had three teams, McLaren, Ferrari and Red Bull in a championship battle. And then we had the last race of the season where we had Fernando Alonso leading the championship, Mark Webber in second, Vettel in third, Lewis Hamilton in fourth. All four of them with the possibility to win the title. I think we might have it this year, this year again. You're joking. I think so. Maybe that would be maybe, great. Maybe we might not have a championship as close as that one because even at that point in time there was some to and fro uh, the momentum changed here and there this season i feel we might be looking at a at a three way battle so four drivers again we'll have four drivers most probably uh, again lewis will be there george charles and max i think it's going to be a four way battle that's what i'm hoping fingers crossed but let's see i mean that's my expectation because I think Red Bull will be compromised at least to an extent. Ferrari, at least from what we've heard, the car will be good. What happens with the team? I hope Vesser does a good job, and Mercedes will be there for sure. So I mean that's my expectation to be honest. What I'm looking at is those four, uh, those three teams fighting to the nail for the championship. Yeah, I. I... I personally still think it's going to be between Ferrari and uh, and Red Bull. Hmm. Because I saw what your you've video. Se- what you've se- what you've seen about um, Mercedes in the last couple of seasons. In 2021, there was a new regulation about the floor. 
mm. you know, they the were cut out. And Mercedes didn't build a car that was, you know, yeah, they it didn't react to that very well. Yeah. And then in 2022, there was new regulations and they went all out, made a lot of hype up front with the, the new uh, side pot um, philosophy. Okay. okay uh, and, 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 it didn't, yeah. and it didn't work. It's probably because of the floor and everything, but still, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't build a, a great car. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, um, now all of a sudden they're going to buy a, build a car that, that is up there, you know, because it's, it's the same people still that work there. Yeah, but so, the same people also won almost eight, eight constructors title on the yeah. truck. <laughs> like the, the engine uh, had a big part in that as well. And then an engine with a, the engine adaptive. is still a question mark right now. I think the Mercedes engine is still a question mark. After the adaptation to the uh, E10 fuel, there it wasn't the best last year. No. That is a question no, mark. No, at some point, all the teams with the Mercedes engine struggled. Yeah. And, yeah, I guess so. Uh, Aston Martin struggled. Williams is always at the back right now. McLaren was not the best. So, yeah, I think it... Uh, look, Logically, there is some sense to what you're saying. But and, I, and everybody says, yeah, at the end of the season, they were great and they won a race. But it was all at high altitude. You know, Mexico was up high and Brazil was up high. And then mm. back in Abu Dhabi, the porpoising uh, stuck its head up again. Mm, true, true. That's there. But then and, uh, and, Zandavo you know, was... I, you're, you're as good as your last race. That's what I always say. <laughs> no, I agree. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I agree on that front. Um, look, there is there is logic to what you're saying. Where where I come from is um, when I'm looking at the 2023 season, my main um, point of focus is who has the bigger scope of improvement. And when I talk about that, I think Red Bull is Red Bull has already aced the regulations. Yeah. that car was good everywhere. Their improvements are going to be minor. Yeah, uh, I won't say that. Their improvements will be there. Uh, if you remember, uh, th there was this report last season that for the last few races, Red Bull had to run the heavier parts because they'd run out of parts. So if you take that into consideration, even last season, they would have been more competitive if they were able to run optimally. Right, at the end of the season. So that will be there. The question, the question mark with Red Bull is the development time. It's low. 63% is quite low. Compare that with where Mercedes and Ferrari are. Anyways, uh, coming to the scope of growth, uh, scope of development, where Mercedes is growing, apparently there is a double digit improvement in the power unit. Uh, they'll have that. Then secondly, the thing is they've learned their lesson last year. The car, the, the car bounced too much last year, but they were able to figure it out by mid-season, most probably. So the car, yeah, roughly around that time. When Lewis went on, I think six to seven races consecutively on podium. So there was something that they had to work with. Will they be able to make a huge jump that they'll jump to the front? I don't think so. But I think they'll still be in a much better place than last season. Yeah. That's the initial impression that I get. And yeah, I think uh, Alpine and um, McLaren are going to be better as well. So if, if Not there's going to be... If there's going to be races where, uh, you know, one of the two Mercedes drivers uh, messes up uh, qualification, then uh, mm. they'll have uh, two or four other cars in front of them. They could. They could. But we've not seen Alpine until now. McLaren is already pessimistic, apparently. Something's wrong with the car. Yeah, that's right. They're not completely happy with uh, where everything is right now. So, yeah. I don't understand what's going on with them, to be very honest. <laughs> they spend so much energy on getting the right drivers, but if the car is not up to the mark, I don't know. I am slightly skeptic of where McLaren will end up. Uh, I'm slightly confident about Aston Martin. The way they are talking and the way their signings have finally, you know, apparently there are reports that Aston Martin is one team that, re that worries Red Bull the most right now. Yeah. That's what I've heard. And that's a big statement. Fernando Alonso in a top team is 
I haven't seen this in 10 years and I'm itching <laughs> for that to happen I once can, again. I can see you smiling from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, Fernando Alonso is an absolute legend. I don't he understand is. how he's doing what he's doing at 40. Just amazing. 41. If he gets a good car. 41. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I keep calling him old, but I'm 45. Oh. <laughs> he's your age. <laughs> yeah. He was the first world champion that I saw. Um, I hated him at that point. Did <laughs> you know that Piastri, that Piastri is coming in this season and um, Fernando was already racing before Piastri was born? Piastri was born, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still this good. <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of the top five drivers on the grid right now, Fernando. Easily for me. Yeah. And, and I, I just like his it. character. Like... <laughs> you know he does he does his little speech at the at the launch first he says yeah we launched the real car that was a dig at uh, red bull everyone then, everyone then he said aston martin is more modest than the previous teams i raced for because um we're not used to winning and those teams were used to winning and uh they became compliant or what is complacent? Complacent. What's the word? Complacent. complacent. Yes. So basically, it was a dig at both McLaren and Alpine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he leaves no one. He, he never leaves anyone. And he's a champion uh, at burning bridges. Yeah. And I, I, I did a feature on him once. Uh, it was entirely on why, what will be Fernando Alonso's legacy. Because on paper, he's a two-time world champion. But he was a two-time world champion in 2006 as well. We are in 23. Yeah. And he's still racing. And he's not won a race in the last decade. He's not been I on think, pole. I think he'll be remembered for um, making bad choices, ma- making bad team choices. Yeah. The thing is, plus, plus I feel, um, look, if Vettel left Red Bull, if he wanted to come back, he will be welcomed with open arms. When he left in 20, 2014, he will be welcomed with open arms. I don't think the same is the case with Alonso. No. I don't. And that's where the biggest issue lies. He kicked Ferrari, he left for McLaren, and initially he had kicked McLaren. The whole Spygate thing had happened. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's what I feel. At least in his case, it it holds. That's true, but uh, he he put um, Alpine in a difficult position as well because he waited till the deadline for Piastri's contract at Alpine had expired, and then he announced that he was going to Aston Martin. That was and then, typical for and, and, and then Alpine said, "Okay, um, Oscar Piastri is our new driver." And then mm. the famous uh, Oscar Piastri tweet came out. <laughs> Otmar looked the, like the, an that, idiot. That, that was Alonso's doing as well, in a, in a way. Yeah. No, it was. It was. It was vintage Alonso, and you can expect him to do something like this because he felt he was not appreciated enough at Alpine. No. He felt that he did. Uh, that's why his outburst against Ocon, which was uncalled for, at least. In my view, um, the guy, uh, you saw that thing, the team radio, uh, when he had the clash with Ocon uh, in Brazil. Yeah. The entire tirade. And the, look, Alonso is the kind of driver who wants to be considered the lead driver in a team. When he's not, he gets a bit rattled. It doesn't work out for him. Let's be fair. Uh, Ocon, even though uh, I think last year, even at Alpine, he was the better driver. I think Ocon was not at his level, to be fair. But Ocon was consistent. He beat him in quite a few yeah. weekends convincingly. And that rubbed him the wrong way. Maybe yeah, that's well, why... Alonso, Alonso had four DNFs more. Yeah. And exactly. he even said, it's like, what number does Alonso drive? The number 13? 14. No? 14. 14. 14. 14. Uh, he says, it's, it's always the number 14 car. <laughs> I don't see, think it was. I, I, like, I, I, I love getting my conspiracy tinfoil hat, tinfoil hat on. Hmm. <clears throat> if, it, if a team wants to test an engine at full full blast 
for mm. a race or two. Mm. Would you do it on Ocon? Or would you do it on Alonso who's leaving? Yeah, but it wasn't known. But Alonso had issues even even in the first half of the season as well. Yeah. I mean, there are... The thing is, he probably blew things out of proportion. He does it every time. Uh, <laughs> Even even during the Honda thing, the McLaren Honda times, he used to say, we have the best chassis in the world. McLaren has the best chassis in the world. <laughs> Only Honda is bad. And when they were, they moved to Renault, the thing is, the McLaren's fortunes remained the same. Yeah. This season might be a good one for Alonso, by the way. That's what yeah, I'm One hoping. of the problems at McLaren was that uh, they forced Honda to make uh, the smallest uh, V6 yeah. power unit possible. <clears throat> The and then that package. didn't work. Whereas Red Bull, when they started working with uh, Honda, said, uh, you make the best engine and we'll build a car around it. Okay, by the way, have you heard? Um, McLaren Honda might be a reality again in yes. 2026. Yes, there's rumors about that as well. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> I can't understand. The kind of negative no. PR McLaren gave Honda during the entire partnership. I find it hard to understand why it's happening. <clears throat> well, the, I... I think uh, they can redeem uh, themselves then. You know, they did with Red Bull. But, um, you know, winning races or getting podiums in Honda McLaren again would uh, erase that bad history. You think it will happen? See, is it, I don't know if it will happen. But No, no. You know, uh, in terms of uh, winning races with Honda, uh, with McLaren. I, I don't see why not. They, they, they built good power units. I mean, Red no, Bull won prizes of, with it. No, no. In terms of uh, the chassis. Will is McLaren capable enough of building a chassis that can win races? See when the new wind tunnels there for McLaren, <laughs> every, everything's gonna change. <laughs> it's all about the wind tunnel. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, no, I'm I'll, not sure either. <laughs> yeah, but again, so uh, McLaren. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> do you have a wild prediction about 2023? Okay, uh, I do. I have two, uh, not one. I have two. Okay, so the first is the one on which I've actually made a video as well. Um, I think Lewis Hamilton retires at the end of the season. That's the first prediction that I think. I'm not entirely sure about it, but I also predicted last season that Vettel will retire at the end of the season, and that happened. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I And what's your reasoning behind it then for Lewis to stop? Uh, one of the biggest is, well, there are quite a few. The first is the money that Lewis gets. It's huge. Second is, Russell is the future at Mercedes. At some point in time, they have to hedge their bets. One has to, you know, one has to think for a, for a change. Uh, Toto Wolf, he remembers what happened when Rosberg and Lewis were together. It was, he could not handle it. He could not manage it in any which way. Another is you should watch Abu Dhabi 2016. I think you saw it. You probably saw what happened. Lewis I saw. Blatantly, yeah. So Lewis he was, blatantly, back in, he was back in Rosberg up. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the biggest thing was he defied team orders quite blatantly. Without any question, without anything. He said, I won't do it. I'll drive the way I want to drive and I'll do it. Wolf remembers that. Now, Wolf and uh, Lewis are pretty close. That's also, I think it's public knowledge now. But how is he going to manage from a business point and from a personal point? At some point in time, Russell and Lewis are going to fight for the title. And things are going to get worse. Now, Russell is the future of that team. Lewis is in. What's going to happen? I fear at some point in time, at least, um, at least I think it's it's a wild guess. But I don't think Mercedes is, is going to offer Lewis the same kind of privileges that he enjoys right now. Or at least yeah. he enjoyed with Bottas in the same team. It's not going to be a preferential treatment. And when that doesn't happen, the relationship usually soars. Yeah. Most importantly, by the way, fun fact, Lewis made $55 million last season. 55 or 54, something like that. Russell made $3 million. Yeah. And Russell outscored him. So one has to ask why at some point in time, Mercedes will be sitting and thinking, why am I going to hire and keep 
running with this driver. Okay, fine. Lewis brings a lot of marketing money. He does. Everyone knows that. But the gap is too big. And if we no, I, look at- I agree with you that, um, you know, you hear here and there the news coming out, you know, Total Wolf gives Lewis Hamilton compliments and says the contract is nearly signed. And then Lewis Hamilton says, yeah, I definitely want to stay on longer. But it hasn't happened yet. And, and then, it has been happening since it, last it, season. It it's slipping through that Hamilton Something's might want to wait wait till the testing is done to see how good the car is. Um, and even Mercedes will be thinking because if Mercedes offers him a two year extension and Lewis wins the title this season and retires, then what's the point of that extension anyway? Yeah. I mean, there are uh, Mercedes needs to make a huge commitment to Lewis. And making a huge commitment when he's 38 years old, charges this much money. And when there is a driver who's pretty much performing at the same level and outscored him last season, you have to think it doesn't make business sense to, you know, give make that kind of commitment to Lewis right now. No, I'm and if anything, sure. Toto, Toto Wolf knows about business. Yeah. He's, he's a billionaire. Yeah. Is he already or is he close to being a billionaire? I think 700 or 800 million something his net worth is. Or he, or has he breached the mark already? I, I think he is. He already is a billionaire. He is. He's the richest yeah. team principal on the grid, no? Yeah. By some distance. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Oh, so this is the first one. Okay, the second one. And this is more likely. Fernando Alonso wins the race this season. Okay. That's a good prediction. I think he will win the race, win a race this season with Aston Martin. At least one. Earlier, I had, I felt that maybe uh, Norris might win one with McLaren, but after the launch, I'm not sure what is going to happen with them. And Alpine, maybe they might sneak through, but that's still more on the basis of luck. Alonso might do it on pace as well. He's that okay. good. I mean, I rate him very highly. So maybe that's one where I'm. I'm not entirely, uh, you can say, confident or I'll put my money on it. But I think that might happen. No, but the, the, the fun thing about a wild prediction is that you can say pretty much anything. I did. And I said Lewis will retire. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a big one. But then um, Alonso win, winning a race with Aston Martin, that's awesome. a big one as well. Awesome. I think it, he will break the record of the most, of the biggest gap between the two, between two race wins. It will be almost a decade. I hope you're success. right. And he, he'd be the first uh, driver to win a race after his 300 mark. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Lewis is also at 300, right? He has crossed the... 300. Yeah, he's 305 or 306. Yeah. So it's between um, these. Depends. Lewis already said that he, he, he was going to beat the, the 300 race curse. Yeah, But it would be fun if it would be series. Alonso. Alonso is not going to let anyone forget that, by the way. <laughs> he will be the first one who will tell everyone, okay, this is what I did. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that's why we love him. I mean, after a point, he was very cringy earlier in 2006, 2007, 8. People didn't used to like him that much. Since his sabbatical and his comeback, no, he's the old man with funny team radios. That's how I look at him. And someone yeah. with, a, with a legendary talent. I mean, just wow. That's how I look at him. I used to hate him, to be honest. But yeah, now I've, you know, you come around. When someone slogs this much for a decade in mediocre cars, you give him his due. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I I, I never uh, hated any drivers. Just some of them annoyed me, you know, in the, in the <laughs> time with uh, young Max Verstappen. He was always battling with uh, Romain Grosjean. And Grosjean kept uh, saying how dangerous uh, Max Verstappen was while crashing into everybody. <laughs> because that man, oh my God. Yeah. He got yeah. banned uh, in 2012, no? For a race because of the crash yeah. in uh, Spa. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember him crashing once. And then he thought, okay, I'm going <laughs> to flip the car and then go st- straight through. And then he ended up on the middle of the road. Uh, the middle of the track. Barcelona 2017 or 18. He crashed into Hulkenberg. Yeah, yeah. I remember that one. And they went on the that grass. And then there was a lot of smoke. 
Yeah. And he, and he, and he ended up on in the middle of the track. But he didn't get the ban for that one, was it? No, no, no. Uh, he got the ban in 2012. The huge collision in Spa at the start of the yeah. race. He locked up. He crashed into Lewis, then into Alonso, then Perez and, and Kobayashi, something like that. It was a huge pileup. And finally got a crash. I think he had like five or six first lap crashes in something in consecutive order. And that's why he got that. Yeah, crazy. and it, and and he's racing in America now, and everybody says it's more dangerous there. But you know, but although he's got a bit of a reputation there as well, doesn't he? A bit. Yeah, I a hear. Uh, I, I, but I, he, I hear uh, new, news coming from there as well. Oh yeah, no, but um, look, uh, Grosjean was, to be honest, in his career, he did the best that he could. He was a good talent. He was fast, but he always had this. I think he also talked about it. He had that psychological issue. There's always that mental yeah. block that he talked about. So he met a psychiatrist, got better. But yeah, I think in terms of the talent that he had, he made the most of what he could <laughs> with whatever he, whatever God gifted him. So yeah. yeah. I mean, that's how I look at him. <clears throat> Fortunately, walked walked out of that fire. I That was scary. Uh, I remember know. that one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I saw footage the other day where they reconstructed what exact what actually happened, you know how the how oh, yeah. the halo just um, pushed his way through the barrier and yeah. and saved his life. That, that was, was amazing. I think that's the second second worst crash that I've seen. Yeah. The first is when Mark Webber just flew. Have oh, you yeah, seen yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, I've seen that one as well. <laughs> Weber has two of these crashes, by the way. He did in Le, Le Mans as well. Weber even crashed on his bike. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of got into the way of his career, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Uh, 2008 or nine, something like that, yeah. he's. Uh, but yeah, even... I think Weber was also very unlucky. To be honest, yeah. if he had a chance in 2010 and Vettel was not in the same team Weber would have won the title yeah. easily bad timing <laughs> yeah that's where he finds himself <laughs> yeah but that's part of the sport as well you know I agree I agree he was fortunate as well that he landed up in Red Bull at that point in time because no one expected Red Bull to be what it became yeah I mean we all I, I never took Red Bull seriously until 2010 in 2009 when it won quite a few races i think it was second in the championship i didn't take it seriously at that point in time even i was not entirely aware how good adrian knew he was but when it all came around that domination was something different and i'll be honest that domination it's different than what the mercedes domination was because it was more of a driver also making a difference I, I saw a video the other day from uh, Driver 61 mm -hmm. um, and it touched on the um, <clears throat> double diffuser being banned mm -hmm. and then I don't know much about the technology but I am interested in it but I just need a lot of catching up to do mm -hmm. but Adrian Newey had invented something that pushed up the um, uh, exhaust gases uh, lifted mm -hmm. it up and and, and and put it back into the car again Blo or something. Uh, or, rear, uh, rear blown diffuser. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but and, he and, and and then and there was a special driving style that Vettel really perfected. he perfected it. Perfected. Yeah. And he was a, he was in a league of his own at that point in time. No one came close. And that's where Weber struggled. Uh, until that point where uh, Vettel had found that particular driving style. No. It was always nip and tuck between him and Weber. Once Vettel found that, there was no stopping him. All three seasons, uh, 2010 was very close. 11, 12, 13 dominance. Quite un unbelievable what he used yeah. to do. Sad he's retired. <laughs> I mean, he was yeah. one of the drivers I looked up to. <laughs> you know, Max talks a lot about his um, retirement as well. That he says, I, I want to do other stuff. And on one hand, I'd hate to miss Max on track. But on the other hand, I'd hate to see him go down, you know? 
you know, the, the, the slope that Alonso look. and Vettel and, you know, all the great drivers at some point, you know, look at Kimi Raikkonen. You know, the, yeah, but the, the thing the, is, that, that was a legendary driver as well. And then, and for for a couple of years, he was just driving in the back at uh, Alfa Romeo or Zauber. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, when it comes to Max, I don't think that's going to happen. To you be know? fair, um, I I, I think he's a man of his word. I no, I think that if, if 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 he wins the championship in twenty in twenty eight and it's uh, the the end of the contract and um. I, I could totally see him walking out, saying, "You know, I've won everything I wanted. I've got kids with uh, Kelly now. <laughs> I'm uh, is, I'm out. Five years, but five years. Remember, think about it. Is it uh, even even right now? I cannot predict what I'll be doing five years later, and no, uh, no one can." Vettel talked about retirement at this age when he won his fourth world title. He was quite quite vocal that okay much a lot of it has been done now it's time for me to you know take a take a step back there was a bit of it lewis talked about it lewis famously said he didn't want to retire uh, he wanted he didn't want to drive till this late in his career he's still doing it and he's <laughs> he's signing apparently a multi-year deal <clears throat> but they imagine if if lewis hamilton had won his seventh uh, championship in 2020 and said this is it you know, he was the, he I'm was not, the goat. He was he the goat. Considered, he will be considered the goat. You know, and you know, not in like, my view. I'll be very very honest. Not in my view. I always considered Michael Schumacher as the goat. Oh, me too. Yeah, but at least in terms but of the that's session. a subject for the next podcast. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, at least in in public eye, Lewis was invincible. By the end of 2020 season, no one thought he would lose. He yeah. ended up losing. He ended up losing a lot. But the thing is, somewhere down the line, he was... If he had retired in 2020, I keep saying this thing. Timing is everything in F1. If he had retired at that point in time, there's the people that are, you know, questioning why he's considered the GOAT, they would be much lesser. Now they've yeah. seen him lose. Now they've seen someone who performs at a higher level or someone who beats him in a similar car. Now questions are coming up. Yeah, so he probably got the timing wrong, and I fear the same thing this year as well. Okay, uh, you made the prediction, right? Uh, I am sorry, I didn't catch the video. Uh, who are you predicting to win the title this season? Is that the guy at the back? <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. Max Verstappen is going to win the title. Yeah. Because <laughs> the the package, the the talent, it's all there. The strategic, the strategists, um, the the whole project is is just running smoothly. Who will be second? Leclerc. Mm, yeah. Sure. That I made a whole video with the you know the twenty know, drivers and the ten teams. I know. I know. I <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. But yeah, I, I saw I saw the thing. I am yet to watch it. But yeah. I'll be reacting to it at the end of the season, (laughs) you know, in the start of 2024. Mm. I'll just let it run and then say, oh, I got this wrong and got that one wrong. (laughs) I got them all right, which I doubt. Oh, no. Uh, I checked it uh, last year. Uh, I did the predictions thing on my on the on sports key only. I think out of seven, I got only two to three. Right. That's all. Everything else was wrong. And that's what happens most of the time. You predict he's going to win the race. Well, I, I got the idea from, um, I think the channel is called F1 Reverse. But I need mm-hmm. to look that up. Mm-hmm. And that man, um, for every position he was off, mm-hmm. you know, he would write down points. He okay. ended up the two predictions, so the teams and the, with 80 points. So it was, it was the... It was the Hmm? Positive, eighty positive. No, no. For, for so if 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 a driver ended up uh, P six and he guessed he was uh, P ten, then he would be four points off, and he okay. ended up with eighty points off. Okay, <laughs> which was the worst one he's ever did. But oh. yeah, he had a laugh about it. So that that's kind of what I'm expecting as well. Yeah, but that's, that's the fun, fun thing part. about blind predictions, you know. Oh. Um, 
it, we haven't seen any testing yet. All we're basing it on is rumors. Yeah. I think we we'll, we are in for a few surprises. Next week yeah. we have it. We have, I think, the testing. We are in for a few surprises. Let's see what happens. So are they testing this year in um, Spain and then Bahrain again? or? No, no, no. Uh, what, only what? one. Yeah. And Bahrain. Three so did, days. They stopped doing that altogether, the two, to the two testing uh, days? Yeah. The last year why they did that was because it was the first year in the new regulations. Oh, this yeah, time yeah. that's not the case. So just the three days. But that's the best part, I think. Um, if Mercedes, just imagine in 2021, if Mercedes had extra days at the start of the season, they would have found whatever issues they suffered from. Yeah. Right. So it, it's a double-edged sword, but I prefer that. Three days of testing is enough for me. So we've been chatting for an hour now. Yeah. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. I agree. So, Charon, I want to thank you for being on this podcast, and um, I'd love to be on your podcast at some point. Sure. Um, I ho- totally hope you're right about, you know, three, four drivers uh, fighting for the championship till the end, and then to see Max winning, obviously. <laughs> um, have you anything you want to add before we I say have... goodbye? Is there anything? I had a great time, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a great chat. Yeah. yeah. Thank so you, you, were, you, you were right. You said this is going to be the best podcast, and it is. Well, I'm a man of my word, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now you're a really cool dude, and I'm definitely going to pass you on to um, Jason from uh, Wheel Sports because sure. uh, I'd love to see the two of you uh, going head to head with nice. all the knowledge you both have. <laughs> it would it would be nice to see. It would yeah. be fun. Look, chatting about Formula One. I mean, what's better? No, there's That's nothing better. better. I agree. Right, Sharon. Something. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> do do it. Have fun.